Hello, uh, my name is Sylvester Henderson. I am a uh, professor of music and uh, the department chair of the Department of Music at Los Madonna's Community College. Um, in addition to those responsibilities, I have an organization that I've started entitled Professor for Life Incorporated, where I have an opportunity to interview various academics from all across the world. And today I am so honored that we are going to be talking with Dr. William Acker, who is professor of geography uh, at Bur from Burbank University in Great Britain, London. And so welcome Dr. Acker. And um, we have a series of questions that we're gonna ask you. And once again, uh, part of the California Educational Institution, we welcome your interview and we're grateful for your interview here uh, in America. So welcome again, sir. Thank you. Good to be here. Okay. And so Dr. Uh, Acker, tell me a little bit about your academic career and journey. Okay. Yeah. So, so as I, let me say, I grew up in um, Great Britain in uh, London, or part of London in East London. My parents came from West Africa, from Ghana to England in the 1960s, where I was born. So I went to school here and then did my undergraduate study in the northwest of Britain, a place called uh, Liverpool. And then really, I suppose, what set me off on my academic journey was that after I finished my undergraduate degree in politics and sociology, I lived in Haiti for a year. I taught English um, there and living in that country, you know, the first independent black republic in the Western Hemisphere, but seeing the conditions of what happened to black people there and how they were living and the struggles that they were facing, that's what led me into postgraduate study. So I did a master's in Pan-Africanism and then I stayed on in Liverpool and then worked at, in a community centre, effectively a black community centre, that whilst I was there became a college. And I taught black studies and black history in that college. And that was essentially to people who had been disadvantaged at school. And then as black adults, when they came into our institution, they were bereft of confidence, bereft of a sense that they could succeed. So we taught black studies as a way of instilling those students with academic confidence and, and uh, philosophy. And then it was whilst I was at that college, I then did my doctorate and then got a job in a higher education college, a place called Edge Hill College. And there I was a um, lecturer in race equality studies. And then I'm sure we'll talk about it a bit later, the precariousness of working in UK academia meant that in those positions, I was just on one year contracts, one year contracts. And so I I left that job and came out of academia for a while whilst I was completing the PhD. I moved to the city of Bristol and then I worked in administration, race equality administration, and then in university, higher education administration, something called widening access, encouraging people from working class, poorer backgrounds into higher education. And then I completed my doctorate and then that's when I got a got the position at um, Birkbeck College, University of London. I yeah, started off there as lecturer, and now I'm senior lecturer or associate professor in Black and community geographies. So that, in a nutshell, is the journey that I've been on to where I am. Today. Okay, you have uh, really unpacked a lot of information. One of the things that um you said there are two words, race and equality. Can you talk a little more about that as it relates to your obtaining of your master's degree in Pan-Africanism, I believe you said it was, from your, uh, now tell me the university again for your- yeah, so, that was, so that was University of Liverpool. Yes, can you talk about your work at the University of Liverpool and some of the challenges uh, that you experienced when teaching English uh, in Haiti 
and some of your aha moments in terms of the work that you could do to help make to help make life better for people of color, uh, not only um, African students but students in general. Mm. Yeah. So certainly. So, I mean, teaching in Haiti. So this would have, so this was the late eighties, early nineties. Um, the country just experienced a a military coup there. So conditions were were quite rough. And then I was teaching English to a range of um, to a range of students. I suppose it just opened my eyes in a sense to the conditions of African descendants globally. You know, that's that's what Haiti really did. The, a country that had been so glorious in our history that it had overcome the might of the imperial powers to gain freedom from enslavement. But here it was really struggling with poverty, really economic degradation. So that kind of motivated me to say, well, what do I want to do with my life? I want to kind of make it my kind of life's focus to try and improve the lived experience of people of African descent. So that's what drew me back to Liverpool, where that's where I did the masters on Pan-Africanism again, trying to think about how do how can we forge global connections between people of African descent? And I suppose that's the whole theory and practice of Pan-Africanism. So that's what really pushed and me. What are, and what are some of the strategies? Or one of what are, give me two or three principles. Uh, mm. that you've engaged in your work as you've helped to uh, improve the quality of what well, have you at as you have improved the quality of uh, education for underprivileged students what mm. are some of the things that you've done in particular uh, in your work maybe you can share you know two or three principles yeah so certainly so teaching about then the the black experience. So, so in the UK, when I started even today, there were not many courses where you could learn and study about the experience of African descendants across the globe. And what you studied was very limited. So certainly in my teaching practice, I've developed modules, programs, courses where one could learn about the, the black experience. Then I've also set up programs, so currently like at a doctoral level, set up like a, this is a kind of a mentoring program or a student program where we bring together black students from across the UK and teach them practices or principles about how to be successful at postgraduate um, level. Work with an organization called leading roots in the UK, Blacks in Academia, which strive to, again, improve outcomes for Black PhD students. So I lead a seminar once a month, led it in the past with colleagues, uh, Dr. Gabriella Beckles-Raymond and Professor Robert Beckford. And in that space, which is a, a Black-only space, a, a private space, we share with those students how can you be successful in your studies? And what are your career prospects going to, to be like? So actually creating spaces for, for black students has certainly been another strategy that I've utilized. Now in your instruction of black students, uh, have you found, uh, or do you talk about, or, or, or are there differences in the way in which African Americans have been treated in Haiti versus um, African American slavery in the U.S. in the United States. Uh, do you talk about some of the differences, some of the similarities, and if so, could you share this with our national audience? Yeah. So um, yeah. So African descendants, because obviously Haitians are not African Americans. So 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 African descendants in the different contexts yes, have similarities and differences in their lived experience. And we do look at some of those um, 
issues in terms of yes yeah, so the the experience of enslavement and what it did in those different contexts and then looking at the different kinds of social movements that have, that have arisen so for example looking at the kind of movements that have arisen in the uk comparing them to the us and movements on the african um continent and i suppose then and it's tricky because i suppose in each context one might argue that we all experience forms of discrimination and uh, anti-blackness, but they might manifest themselves differently in certain um, contexts. So, and in, and, in, and in the UK, so let's do UK, US comparison. Our population numbers are small. So it's rare that you would have black only spaces. So we don't have um, black only institutions. We're predominantly teaching in white spaces, white institutions where where black people are most all the time in the kind of um, minority and oftentimes quite invisible in the um, in that regards. So to introduce notions of black empowerment in those spaces in the UK. I suppose what I would say it's much more difficult than it would be kind of in the US in certain cities where you've got a majority of people or you've got spaces where at least you've got a critical mass of black scholars and black students to engage with. Now, um, black empowerment. Wow, I like I like those two words, that combination. Um, as a, as a uh, black academic and scholar, what are some of the personal uh, challenges and awareness awareness uh, that you have um, yourself um, experienced? What could you tell? What could you say to a scholar uh, or a young scholar, male or female, who may want to consider studying or following similar steps from your academic tra trajectory? What could you tell them? um to look out for when studying in the uk because mm -hmm. it, it really it really is amazing to me uh as i told you some of the other scholars that i know in great britain i've always had a um uh, even as a child for some reason i've always had a fetish with uh the united kingdom um i like many of its construction its buildings and what have you and the culture has always been very enriching to me so one of the things that i was uh shocked to find was that there are really few black academics in the uk especially noted ones mm -hmm. and so um as a black academic what could you tell a person uh if they consider to, let's say, move from the United States to the UK to study or to look for work, what are some of the, uh, uh, I would say, watch points that the person would need to be aware of? Um, certainly that, um, that racism in the UK is real, but it's much more subtle than it, than it is in the in the us because in terms of um everyday socializing friendliness people in the uk would probably be quite friendly there's a lot of socializing between black and white in the in the us not so much kind of segregated spaces so that might make you think that everything is fair and justified and because it's a liberal society liberal institutions people think, ah, oh, it's it's fine, but it's only when you're then in those spaces and it's like you have to justify why you are there as a black person and justify why you're teaching certain subjects in order to get those things recognized and noticed. It's almost like there seems to be an assumption that you're kind of second class kind of thing or, or what you're doing doesn't have value because as i say there's not um 
there's not institutionalized uh, black studies or Africana studies or black British studies in UK institutions. Everything you have to struggle for and justify. And how can it be that for global majority peoples that their, that their subject areas are not seen as normal within those spaces is something that, that's justified. So it's those kinds of uh, things. Um, as we were discussing before, we don't have the tenure process in the in the in the in the, in the, in the United Kingdom. You you apply for positions and then you get the positions and then you apply for your promotions. But your job is not secure. And many um, academics of colour in the UK find themselves in a situation where they're just on very short term contracts. So you might work for a year or two, then you've got to get your contract renewed or you've got to find another job. And so at each stage, it means your career can be undermined because you don't have that security and you're doing a lot of teaching, then it means you don't get to do research, publications, get the grants, what you need to kind of then get the kind of promotions and the kind of job security yeah, that you need, which is why you see so few um, fully fledged uh, black professors within the UK higher education system. That has to be a challenge uh, because I have been tenured so long, I cannot imagine working in a world where your academic freedom and speech is compromised because mm -hmm. in the context of higher education within California or the United States, that's a big deal. There are many, there are many um, politicians and I would say um, ac administrators who fight against tenure in the United States system. But that's one of the greatest accomplishments. And so that has to be a challenge and it has to be emotionally painful to have worked so diligently to obtain such a wonderful education and then be at a place where you have no job stability. So that's, uh, that kind of gets us to our next question, which was originally challenges as a black male academic and scholar that you just kind of answered many of them. Um, man, that has to be really difficult because do you find yourself uh, fearful of speaking your academic truth <laughs> in spaces <laughs> such as this because you're worried about what your dean or what your vice president or is going to think or going to say. Uh, that has to be a challenge because my mouth is so big, unfortunately, that <laughs> I say and do what the world I want to do uh, because I'm in mean, within reason. Uh, but I, I feel very strongly that's one of the treasures of academic freedom. But I wonder, man, that has to be difficult because uh, just I, I want you to expound on that. Like, does it uh, stifle the way in which you communicate? Uh, I suppose I would say that in a way I view my academic work as a as a calling. So it's not so it's not kind of uh, dependent on who's paying me my wages <laughs> in, a, okay. in a sense. And in a way, that's what I would coming back to your previous question. In a way, that's what I would tell people who want to kind of enter into this system that my desire to do what I do comes because I want to, as I say, improve the lived experience of people in our communities and that's what drives me you know the the academic space for all its flaws and issues it does provide a platform to do that which is why i operate within that space it does provide a, a platform to do things like this to talk to the public to to write and to do those broader engagements but i don't forget that those spaces are still institutionally racist and problematic and that those need to be challenged so yes that is precarious and it is a and it is a, a challenge because like you say you know you you could 
come across people who don't like what you're saying, don't like what you're doing. But I'd say then you have to look, I would say, as a black scholar in the UK and in different spaces as well, not just the UK. You have to look bigger than your institutional space and look to what is it that you're being called to do and to always, in a way, keep that engagement with your community. So alongside teaching in the university, I always try to do community activity. So with some colleagues in the community, we host a space called the Black Pack, where we give, where we invite speakers to come and share the wisdom of the Black experience and give that to the community to share knowledge and wisdom with the wider community. And it's those kinds of things that um, keep me going. And also having international networks, because with so few Black academics in the UK, and you're operating within white, is that it's very isolated. So to kind of get a sense of um, value for your work and its importance, it's almost like you have to seek that outside. So I'm, so I'm part of a, I'm a chair of a network called the Transatlantic Roundtable on Religion and Race. And that brings together scholars, activists, faith-based leaders from across Africa and the African diaspora. And we host conferences, produce reports. And that really gave a lifeline to my academic work. You know, when I was feeling some of those pressures in the UK, the sense of isolation and the sense of struggle, joining that network really, yeah, empowered me, gave me a sense of validation and a renewal of spirit that, that what I was doing was important. And then, and then the funny thing about the UK as well is that it's like those external validations, if you're working internationally, it, they like it because it brings prestige then on the, on the institution. So it's almost like they don't, you didn't get the support initially, but then once you were engaged in that kind of work, then the university gets recognition for that and then starts to like those kinds of things that you're doing. And then you can get recognition for that work. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> you have just shared a lot of wonderful uh, mm -hmm. principles and realities with our uh, viewing and listening audience. Um, I want to, before we go to question number three, um, you said something that's very, very important to me because I'm a man of faith, is that you look at your work as a calling very much like a ministry. So more like, kind of like a pastor of, uh, of uh, social justice, you know, in terms of what you've done. Uh, because everything that you're talking about are many of the principles that I found in the good book. And, um, and I'm talking more just from a humanitarian standpoint about helping people and improving race inequality and improving just the conditions of our lives uh, overall. So I appreciate uh, you sharing those principles. Listen, um, the next question that I would like to ask is social justice studies in the UK with African American studies. Can you talk about that a tad more? In, um, we've had African American studies in the United States for some time. Um, not that it has really been developed uh, like it should, not that it has um, really been respected like it should, but it's been on the books for an adequate amount of institutions. Now, whether the institutions administratively or politically really honor uh, what's on the books is another dilemma to discuss. But um, how do you develop or what are your experiences regarding the definition of social justice studies and the struggles of trying to infuse uh, African-American studies principles courses within the UK system, systems, not necessarily your university in particular, but just in higher education, the context of higher education in the UK? Yeah, well, it's certainly been a, a, a challenge, and I'd say it's kind of <laughs> light years behind the, behind the US. Like I was teaching a course, teaching a module just last night about the kind of 
the trajectory of black studies in the UK compared to the to the US. So, so in the UK, really the, the impetus for that those kinds of studies again emerges out of community. So black parents were, were their children being failed in the education, the mainstream education system in the UK in the late 60s. I mean, it goes back much further, but this is the, the kind of um, genesis. So they established what were called supplementary schools or Saturday schools. And it was there that they started to teach their children black studies, black history, to give those children a sense of value. Because in school, they would be discriminated against. In school, they weren't seen as being valuable or equal. So that's where it kind of um, started. So as, as then black fledgling academics begin to emerge in the UK in the system, they then begin to develop courses. So remember a, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Hakeem Abbey, who was then at a university called Middlesex, he was probably the first to develop a course in black history to develop a, a degree course. But again, the challenge, you start the program, but then the institution doesn't really support the program. So after a couple of, after a few years, the course closes. And again, and it's so, and then that's what it's tended to happen. It becomes a bit fashionable in certain periods. People fight, they struggle, students struggle, academics struggle to say, there's a lack of inclusion, there's a lack of black minority ethnic star. So you might get a course set up or a, or a module, not a whole program of administrative support, but just a course maybe within a course. But if it doesn't recruit well or go well, then it gets uh, shut down eventually. Or if that academics leaves, then the course will leave with them. So there's more recently, you've seen some more programs develop. So uh, at Birmingham City University with Professor Kahindi Andrews, he's the first full professor of Black Studies in the UK. And so they have an undergraduate degree there in, in Black Studies, but that's the only fully fledged program within the UK system. You have other programs. I think there was like um, a master's program in Black British history at uh, Goldsmiths University of London. But again, they brought the person in to develop that program and design that program. But now that program, I think it's either closed or it's certainly under threat of closure. The person has left. And, it, and that trend seems to happen. So in the wake of the heinous murder of George Floyd, you had renewed pressure within the system and people that had been arguing before George Floyd. So student movements and fledgling academic movements arguing, why isn't my professor black? Why my curriculum white? Decolonizing the curriculum. And those things then has led to some shifts by the system. But I'd say what tends to happen again is like you get um, uh, reforms or initiatives. So you'll get money and a, and a development, maybe a two or three year project to do something to set something up, but it's never permanent. It's never a permanent structure with a permanent research center, permanent research funding, which would give you the security to really develop programs and courses um, long, long term. So that's the real issue within the UK, within the UK system that a lot of the work, like I say, is, is grassroots. It's the community academics, community activists who may have a connection with the university or, or not with the university, or it's individuals that develop a module, develop a program out of their specialist research interest. But we don't have, like I say, in a sense, apart from Birmingham City University and a few other places, we don't have a core of people working in one institution, developing a whole 
suite of courses that then become programs where you have dedicated faculty of color running those programs. Now you just mentioned something uh, which leads um, me to um, more extensive inquiries uh, regarding what you're saying. You talked about Dr. Kehinde Andrews at Birmingham City University being a full professor. Uh, do you think his ranking assisted him in being able to develop the only African-American degree study program in the UK? And really, what are some of the differences in the UK? How do you become a, f a full professor? And what does that mean in reality? Mm. And, and what impact would it have on the development of programs for folks or young people of color? Mm. So, so if you compare like to the US, so, um, so you'd have like assistant, associate, full. So we have lecturer, senior lecturer, reader, full professor. So, um, so, so full professor is the highest level that you can um, achieve within UK academia. It's not tenure, but it's, you know, it's, it's good pay. You may have a, a chair. It gives you a certain kind of um, status um, within the institution. So, but they're only. Is, you know, can, can I interject for a second? Is it a contract when you're a full professor? Are you given like a ten-year contract, a five-year contract, or the contracts are they still the same? A year uh, appointments? No, no, no. So it's um, so it's uh, open-ended, but. But it's not like the it's not like the it's not like the US. So it's open ended, but you could still you can still be fired, <laughs> or you can still be made okay. redundant if, if the institution has problems financial or those kinds of things. So it's not it's not guaranteed um, regardless. But it does give you a certain amount of security and a certain amount of um, authority within the hierarchy of the. Uh, of UK academia. But the issue is, I suppose, is that it's not so much like the individual. What I say is like you need a, a critical mass. You know, if you want to run a program in black studies, like you can't just have one scholar. <laughs> you know, you've got to have like four or five scholars. You've got to have a department, haven't you? So, so, so where Birmingham City has achieved that is actually that it has a department with a critical mass, but it's probably the only department in the UK that has that critical mass. Most other departments, you can name the departments, whether it's geography, politics, history, sociology, you know, you probably got to find at best two scholars of colour working in a department and probably the, across most places, you've got to find one scholar one black school, one African descendant scholar working. So obviously, so you can't develop a whole program. You've only got one scholar per <laughs> department. <laughs> um, make it a, yeah, yeah, make it a program. You don't so have academic a, champions. Yeah, precisely, yeah, to, uh, to, to, to do that, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so you'd have to work with, yeah, either other colleagues or you'd, you know, you'd have to work across departments to develop a, a program and then that means you need higher level institutional support to get the go-ahead then to develop mm. such a program and uh, and an initiative and like i say it's it hasn't happened in it's only happened in very few institutions in the, in the uk well a lot that you shared talked about talks about um the inequality and racism in the UK, the Academic Academy within the United Kingdom. Uh, the challenge is that I wonder, do the, uh, does the legislation and uh, the university uh, high up folk, I'll call it, <laughs> do they really understand um, that Black Lives Matter in a sense in the UK, you know, that Black Lives Matter all over the world uh, everyone's lives matter, but 
uh, especially people of color, African Americans in particular, uh, their lives matter. And so all of these inequalities, uh, I'm wondering what are some of the additional things that can be done to improve these spaces because it has to be very challenging to try to serve a community uh, and serve students and to educate the mind. Uh, and it's kind of and it's kind of and it's kind of unique in that London is known as such a liberal country. You know, in the the way the United States views the UK, it seems like uh, a larger version of San Francisco. And San Francisco is ultra liberal. Uh, mm -hmm. And I hear that London is very liberal and inclusive, but yet uh, you find all of these inequalities mm -hmm. in this community that advocates and promotes, promotes itself as being so inclusive. And mm -hmm. so that to me is where you, where you've talked earlier about the hidden racism mm -hmm. is that, um, you put stuff on paper and use your lips to say things, but in reality, the financial support and the political support and the structures are really not there. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the strategies, uh, are some of the ways that you would encourage um, some students from the United States uh, to study in Great Britain? And why would they want to come to Great Britain to study? Uh, what are some of the advantages of studying not only at your university, but at universities in Great Britain? What would the, especially the Russell Group University, I like that name, you know, the prestigious ones, uh, would so few people of color, is it really a benefit? Or would it be a benefit? Could you expound upon um, those inquiries? Yeah. I would say, yeah, for a student, for a black student from the US to come to the UK to experience a different kind of African diaspora, that would be the, the value. Yes, there is um, a cachet or a status to studying at a Russell Group University and in a sense the power that comes from having those labels and markers one shouldn't take them lightly but I wouldn't say just come to the UK to do that because if you get caught up in that ivory tower <laughs> you may find that yeah you know as I say you may gain the whole world and lose your soul so I think it's <laughs> if you come to the if you come to the to the UK the the richness would be that learning in a sense and understanding then the different kinds of African diaspora and other minority black and global majority communities that um, exist here. That that richness I think would be really valuable to understand that you know that there's been a black experience in Britain for a thousand years there are communities up and down the, the country and the opportunity to interact and engage with those communities i think yeah well, is is very rich yeah so as you said london it's a very sociable place very dynamic place and britain's larger cities have that kind of multicultural uh flavor so that opportunity to mix with so many different people, cultures, religions, ethnicities, and then to integrate that into one's academic work. I think it really broadens your mind and broadens the horizons. So in a sense, that's why I think you would want to to do it and then to be in solidarity, I think, with, with black communities in different spaces. Well, you know what? You have enlightened me. I have to retire from my job in the United States and apply for some work so that but I want to be I want to make sure that um, I am uh, very aware of some of the challenges that um, the UK offers. <clears throat> Excuse me, but it sounds like the probability 
uh, or looking towards the future, the goals and the promises that the few African American academics could offer students in the UK are just life changing. Uh, because there's such there's so few of you that the ones of you that worked and stayed together uh, create a powerful source of pioneers. That pioneers is probably a good way of saying it, of pioneers that help change the life and improve the ministry of higher education. I can hear Dr. Acker through all of your work that it sounds like you are very connected with the faith-based community as well in, um, in the UK. And um, not sure if you are or not, but it just sounds like your uh, speaking reminds me of a very humble pastor and who really looks at their work, not only as a calling, but as a mission. And so they're in it for the right reasons, to change communities, to, to change the street, to change a nation of young people to come and to offer programs and learning and knowledge that will improve their lives forever. So from that standpoint, I wanna say thank you. I have completed my questions that I have for you. And I wanna know if you have any questions of me or if there's anything else you would like to share with our listening audience uh, before we conduct our interview. I am so honored to have had an opportunity to finally meet you. <laughs> I've heard so many <laughs> wonderful things and we've communicated on uh, WhatsApp for some time, but to be able to, I'm very enthralled uh, by mm -hmm. the knowledge and information that mm -hmm. I have learned from all the various African-American, uh, and I use the word African-American, I'm just gonna say black academics from mm -hmm. the uh, from Great Britain. <laughs> So are there anything else you would like to share uh, with our America, uh, our American audience? Yes, I'd say, like I say, that those that our global connectedness as African descendants is so important, you know, that 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 like we say, we've just met, but it feels like we have a brotherhood, <laughs> you know, and, it, and it's that power because I have to say, you know, when I talk to students in the UK and we might think of ourselves sometimes that we're in a minority, that we're small in number, that we are, you know, fighting against uh, the tides, but the inspiration can be broader. We're part of a bigger global African descendant community. And as we forge these connections, as we have dialogues like this and people listen around the globe, I think that inspiration carries through. So in a way, it's, it's just an encouragement that whatever space you're in, like, like to give credit to the work that you're doing, the what you're doing that shines a light on these issues, lifts up people in different hemispheres, is so important, isn't it? And it may not show itself immediately, but over time, we see that change does happen that we've got to keep pushing and keep pressing on. So I really thank you for the for the opportunity. Thank you for the incredible work that, that you're doing to kind of lift up these spaces. And I hope that people watching, whether that's in the UK, US, Brazil, wherever across the African diaspora, Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa, that they kind of realize, yes, that they're part of a big global family and that will need to support each other. Well, Dr. Aka, you are my brother. You know, mm -hmm. I'm hoping one day to be able to attend your conference uh, physically one day when I make it to Great Britain. And mm -hmm. if ever you make it to the United States, mm -hmm. um, I live in a little city called Stockton, California, mm -hmm. presently. I moved here recently. Um, I would be very honored to host you and to welcome you. I want to thank you on behalf of my company, Professor for Life Incorporated, for taking the time to share your academic principles, your journeys, and your beliefs. Uh, from that standpoint, we're going to close our interview. 
I wish nothing but blessings for you in the future for all the work you do. But even if we don't talk daily, there is an emotional connection that I agree that we have established as brothers, as academic brothers. God bless you and hope to talk to you soon. Thank you. All right then, God bless you. Bye-bye now.